Hidden no more. Our history had been hidden by this oppressive system for so long but, just as you cannot drown a football in a bucket of water because it will still rise to the top, so you cannot hide truth for too long. It will eventually reveal itself. Today, we will be looking at some crucial things that you need to know about the Songhai Empire. We are not talking about the usual stuff you can easily and quickly google but let's take a good deep dive into this kingdom. Songhai was one of the largest and most influential empires in West Africa. Situated in the region encompassing present-day Mali, Niger, and Nigeria, the empire's heartland was along the Niger River. This river was a strategic location for trade and agriculture. This geographical advantage facilitated the growth of Songhai as a major economic and political power in the region, with control over key trade routes connecting West Africa to North Africa and beyond. The Songhai Empire, as you may or may not know, rose after the fall of the Mali Empire. The Islamic religion had long been established in other empires like Ghana and Mali. In Songhai Kingdom, at least initially, it had a somewhat precarious existence. The famous King Sunni Ali observed certain Islamic practices like the Ramadan fast for political purposes, but he was still attached to African traditional religion. A huge percentage of Songhai subjects still followed African traditional religion. Islam was introduced to the region through trade and conquest. Mosques, Islamic schools, and centers of learning flourished in cities like Timbuktu. In the indigenous religion, it was thought that spirits possessed certain objects, the specially impressive natural phenomena, trees, caves, and prominent natural features. Some spirits were linked to the Niger River and thunderstorms. These spirits and others were offered food and drink and honored with masked dances and ceremonies. There were also practicing priests who made it their business to minimize the interference of evil spirits in village affairs. Agriculture was vital to the economy and society of Songhai Empire. It provided sustenance for its population and contributed to wealth and stability. Songhai farmers cultivated a variety of crops suited to their environment. Staple crops included millet, sorghum, rice, and maize, which formed the dietary foundation for the population. Millet and sorghum were particularly well suited to the region's semi arid climate, requiring less water than other grains. Rice was cultivated along the Niger River. Can you guess why? Rice is grown in water and this crop benefited from the region's abundant water supply and fertile soils. Farmers also grew legumes such as cowpeas and peanuts. In areas prone to seasonal fluctuations in water availability, such as the Sahel, Songhai farmers employed various irrigation techniques to ensure consistent crop yields. They constructed intricate networks of canals, dikes, and reservoirs to capture and manage water from the Niger River. Amazing, right? African people have always been blessed with intelligence that knows how to work with nature. These irrigation systems allowed farmers to cultivate crops year-round, meaning that they were not severely affected by droughts. The city of Timbuktu, for example, benefited from a sophisticated network of wells and canals that sustained its agricultural productivity. They did all this without the help of Chinese or Western kingdoms. How about that? To maintain soil fertility and productivity, Songhai farmers practiced crop rotation and soil management techniques. They alternated the cultivation of different crops to prevent soil depletion and erosion, replenishing nutrients in the soil naturally. Farmers also employed organic fertilizers such as compost and manure to enrich the soil and enhance crop yields. Yes, you had that right. Organic fertilizers. That's the keyword. These sustainable agricultural practices contributed to the longevity and resilience of Songhai farming systems. In terms of livestock, Songhai farmers kept cattle, sheep, goats, and poultry. Livestock also served as a form of wealth and a means of exchange in the empire's economy, with cattle being prized as a symbol of prosperity and social status. 
Surplus crops were traded within the empire and exchanged for other goods, including salt, textiles, and luxury items. The empire exported grains and other agricultural products to neighboring regions in exchange for valuable commodities such as gold, ivory, and slaves. Songhai farmers harnessed the natural environment to meet the needs of their civilization. And it is what we need to do as well. The Songhai Empire was divided into urban districts containing at least 35 cities, which blended into suburban districts and peripheral territories. The territories farthest from the central region contained vassal states and tribes. The Songhai vassals were largely autonomous but were required to pay taxes and contribute soldiers to military expeditions. New territories were frequently added through military conquest under Songhai rulers. After the conquest, military leaders were installed in each territory. Conquered populations became indentured laborers. As the region developed, the emperor appointed permanent leadership to maintain the population under a loose military regime. Over time, indentured servants were integrated into society and allowed to pursue a variety of occupations. The city of Gao was the nation's administrative capital, while the cities of Timbuktu and Jen were economic and cultural centers. These were led by semi-autonomous governments. The king appointed governors to lead urban districts with the support of a system of civil servants. The king was helped by advisors, religious leaders, security, and members of the imperial family. The king had sole and final authority to enact law by decree, appoint government leaders, and create treaties with foreign states. A central council of ministers assisted the king by leading the nation's executive offices. The ministries were divided into a departments, including the treasury, military, domestic affairs, religion, and agriculture. You can see that it was a complex system. Nothing primitive about it. Each region had a court system with appointed judges who administered a blend of Islamic and tribal law. What about famous Timbuktu? Timbuktu emerged as a renowned center of learning and scholarship during the Songhai Empire era. Under the patronage of rulers such as Askia Muhammad I, 1493-1528, Timbuktu flourished as a vibrant hub of education, attracting scholars, theologians, poets, and students from across Africa, the Mediterranean, and the Middle East. Islamic education was at the forefront of learning in Timbuktu. The city was home to numerous Quranic madrasas and centers of Islamic learning known as ribots. Timbuktu also boasted impressive libraries, which housed vast collections of manuscripts on a wide range of subjects, including theology, astronomy, mathematics, medicine, history, geography, and literature. Timbuktu was a cosmopolitan city and thus there was a vibrant exchange of ideas, knowledge, and cultural traditions among scholars of diverse backgrounds. Students and scholars from West Africa, North Africa, the Middle East, and even Europe converged in Timbuktu. Timbuktu gained renown for its manuscript culture, with scholars and scribes producing a vast number of manuscripts on various subjects. These manuscripts were meticulously written and meticulously preserved, often bound in leather and adorned with intricate designs. Timbuktu's libraries, including the famous Sanko University, housed thousands of manuscripts, making the city a treasure trove of knowledge and a beacon of intellectual inquiry. Timbuktu also contributed to the spread of Islam in West Africa. The Songhai Empire began to decline from the last quarter of the 16th century. The last nail on the coffin for this great empire was when the Moroccans attacked. The Moroccan leader Ahmad al-Mansur al-Dahabi sent a small force of perhaps 4,000 men armed with muskets to attack the empire in 1590. The Songhai army numbered some 30,000 infantry and 10,000 cavalry, but their weapons could not compete against the Moroccans' cannons and muskets. As a result of this technological mismatch, the Moroccans won the war. The Songhai treasury was seized and the empire, including Timbuktu, was absorbed into that of the Moroccans, becoming a province therein. The Songhai Empire would be the last of the great empires that had dominated West Africa since the 6th century.